1947, there was a young Bedouin shepherd, and he and his friend had uh, left the flock of sheep and goes to search for a stray. And in the crumbling limestone cliffs that line the northwestern rim of the Dead Sea, he found a cave in the crevice of a steep, rocky hillside. Intrigued, he threw a rock inside into the dark interior to see what he'd find, only to be startled by the sound of breaking pots. He had stumbled on what many call the greatest find of the century, the Dead Sea Scroll. He and several companions brought the scrolls to Kondo, a Bethlehem antiquities dealer, for appraisal. Intrigued by his findings, Kondo sent the two back into the hills to see if they could come up with more treasures. And in total, over 800 ancient scrolls were discovered in 11 different caves from 1947 to 1956. And when Hebrew University professor Eliezer Sukhanet caught wind of the scrolls' discoveries, he set out to investigate the significance of the finds. Opening the scrolls, he was amazed to see Hebrew manuscripts 1,000 years older than any of our known existing texts at the time. We're in our series. We're about to conclude our series. Next week we'll be concluding it. But we're in this series about I have uh, not enough faith to be an atheist. And the realities are that the belief in a God, in a created God, uh, one who uh, sustains this universe, um, takes less faith, I believe, than believing that nothing came out of nothing, and that, that, that all of it came into existence on its own. We, uh, we're checking out the, the reliability of our Christian faith, and in doing so, we're doing a, a systematic study, if you will. We started with the premise, is there even truth to begin with? And so we're looking at whether truth exists. Can we count on truth being there, an absolute truth? And we saw that we can. We then looked at the idea, is, is there a God? You know, can we count on there being a God? We looked at all, all the concepts of, of uh, co uh, cosmological arguments and theological arguments that, that prove that, yes, there is a theistic God out there. We just, uh, at that point, we have not discovered whether it's um, uh, the God of, of Islam or the God of Judaism or the God of Christianity. But we do know that there's a the uh, theistic God out there. And then we looked at the, uh, this last week, we looked at the idea of if miracles are possible. Because if miracles aren't possible, then our entire Christian faith is, is on a very poor bedrock, right? Because our faith is believing that Jesus Christ came to this earth as, as a man, died on the cross on our behalf, was buried, but that he rose again. And that is the miracle that we count on. And if miracles are not possible, then we have nothing. In fact, Paul said our faith is, is, is worse than for infidels. Um, and so we looked at that. Now this week we're going to look at that concept of the theistic God. So is it the God of the Quran, or is it the God of the Bible? The Quran, of course, being the holy work of the uh, Islamic faith, and the Holy Bible being our book, the book of Jew, both Judaism, and then when you add the New Testament, Christianity. So today we're going to be looking at the concept of, uh, of the Old Testament and whether it's something that we can uh, believe in. You know, and focus on the families, the truth project, the apologetics project. Uh, R.C. Sproul said this, if we can establish the existence of God and the trustworthiness of sacred scripture, then 90% of the work of the defense of Christianity has already been solved. You see, we, we're looking at a law of what's called law of non-contradiction, that two things that are mutually exclusive cannot all be the same and all be right. And so, for instance, when you have Islam and Judaism and Christianity, each saying that their religion is, is the correct one, and the other two uh, are maybe wonderful people in them and all of that, but they're not the true um, religion. They can't all be the true religion. They can't all be right at the same time. So we're going to be looking again at these issues. And you may be saying, well, wait a second, uh, Pastor. Don't get carried away with this Bible thing. It isn't it, after all, just a book that was written by ordinary men. So we're going to look at that this morning. We're going to look at the first thing is the authorship of the Bible. See, the Bible is just not one book with 39 chapters of the Old Testament, with 39 chapters, and, and a Bible complete with 66 books. It's traditionally, the Old Testament is 23 authors who wrote 39 books over a thousand year period. 23 authors who, for the most part, had never met one another, and all wrote about controversial topics, yet all 39 books are in full agreement with one another. That is miraculous in itself. So you have really three options when it comes to the authorship of the Bible. Either the Bible was written by good men, or the Bible was written by bad men, or the Bible was written by God himself. So let's look at those three options. Was the Bible written by merely good men? 
No, because the Old Testament alone claims over 2,600 times to be written by God. It is inconceivable that good men would lie about the same subject 2,600 times. Good men would not say, thus saith the Lord, when it actually is their own invention. Well, so maybe the Bible was written by bad men. No, would bad men write a book that continually lifts men and women up in the highest plane of morality and purity and demands the most exacting standards of righteousness and pronounces doom upon all sinners? Bad men would not do that. So the only logical alternative is the Bible was written by God. And if the Bible was written by God, it is reliable and true. Because as we've seen earlier in this series, its author, God himself, is reliable and true. So, okay, Pastor, but everyone knows the Bible is an ancient book. It's been, its content has been changed over the centuries, right? Well, let's look at that. Number two, the authenticity of the Bible. Prior to the discovery in 1947 of those Dead Sea Scrolls that I mentioned earlier, the oldest known Old Testament manuscripts dated back to 1008 B.C., so a thousand years roughly before Christ. That's a long time after the originals were written between uh, 1450 and 400 B.C. So one could honestly question, after many centuries of copying, do we really have the same text? Do we have the original words that were written centuries and centuries before? But see, the Dead Sea Scrolls push that range back a thousand years. Those scrolls contain fragments from every single book of the Old Testament, except for some reason the book of Esther, um, and in fact also includes the entire book of Isaiah. And so all uh, these scrolls uh, uh, date back uh, to 75 BC was when they were written, and they were found uh, you know, so much later. So the Old Testament scholars were then able to compare this text of Isaiah with the earliest existing copy of Isaiah dating to 1089 AD. Their conclusion, 95% word for word copying accuracy almost 1100 years later. 95% copying it down, how can that be? And the 5% of variations is more th nothing more significant than omitted letters or maybe some uh, misspelled words. These ancient Bible manuscripts then actually verify the exact opposite, <laughs> that the content of the Bible has not been changed down through the centuries. Okay, Pastor George, but what about all the errors and the contradictions of the Bible? I keep hearing about all these errors that are in the Bible. Well, a lot of folks claim the Bible is filled with errors and contradictions, but a majority of people who make that claim know very little about the Bible itself. The fact of the matter is, the vast majority of folks who have studied the Bible in depth are amazed at its accuracy, that there are no errors and omissions. Firstly, we'll look at the scientific accuracy of the Bible. The Bible is not a science book, we need to make that clear. However, whatever observations it makes about the world of nature is true. Skeptics argue that the Bible is full of scientific errors, but that isn't the case. Every now and then the theories of science disagree with the teachings of the Bible, but usually the theories of science just need some time to catch up with what the Bible says. Consider these examples here. Job 38.16 says this, Have you explored the springs from which the seas come? Have you explored their depths? Almost all the ocean floor is in total darkness, and the pressure there is enormous. It would have been impossible for Job, the author of this, to have explored the springs of the sea. There was no such concept at this time that there would be springs in the sea. Until recently, in fact, it was thought that oceans were fed only by the rivers and the rain that bring the water in. But in the 1970s, with the help of a deep diving research submarine that constructed withstand 6,000 pounds per square inch of pressure, oceanographers discovered there really are springs that bring water up from the ocean floors after all. Job 26.7, God stretches the northern sky over empty space and hangs the earth on nothing. Other ancient writings from this time declared that the earth sat on the back of an elephant or on the back of a turtle or was held up by Atlas himself. But the Bible alone states what we now know to be true. He hangs the earth literally on nothing. Jonah 2, 5 and 6. I sank beneath the waves and the waters closed over me. Seaweed wrapped itself around my head and I sank down to the very roots of the mountain. And only in the last century have we discovered there are towering mountains and deep trenches in the depths of our oceans and seas. Genesis 3.19 by the sweat of your brow you will have food to eat until you return to the ground from which you were made, for you were made from dust, and to dust 
you will return. And science has now discovered the human body is comprised of uh, some 29 base and trace elements, all of which can be found in the earth. And then lastly, Isaiah 40, verse 22. God sits above the circle of the earth. The people below seem like grasshoppers to him. He spreads out the heavens like a curtain and makes his tent from them. The circle of the earth. At a time when many thought the earth was flat, the Bible's told us that the earth is not. It is spherical, long before anyone discovered that. So there's no conflict between science and the Bible. It's just that sometimes the theories of science need to catch up with what the Bible has already shared with us. Then there's the historical accuracy of the Bible. As it's not a science book, it's also not a history book. But the history it records is reliable and accurate. Archaeology is one of the historian's basic tools, and it has confirmed the historicity of the Bible time and time again. For a long time, the only reference to an Assyrian king by the name of Sargon was found in this verse, Isaiah 21. It was therefore uh, in the year when King Sargon of Assyria sent his commander-in-chief to capture the Philistine city of Ashdod. For a long time, that was the only reference to this supposed king that existed. And, uh, but in 18, 184, the French vice consul and archaeologist in Mosul, I believe that would be 1844, uh, in, in what we now call northern Iraq, but in Mosul, it uncovered the great city of Horsabad, and Sargon is now one of the best known Assyrian kings in the ancient world today. The Bible was the first to bring it up, but archaeology confirmed it. In 1850, German scholar Ferdinand Hitzing wrote a commentary on the book of Daniel. And he boldly declared that Belshazzar was a figment of the writer's imagination, since the only references in known history to him were found in the book of Daniel. But four years later, the British consul in Basra, J.E. Taylor, discovered four identical capsules, uh, time capsules, from the building works of King Nabodonus of Babylon, in which he offers a prayer for himself and, quote, Belshazzar, my firstborn son, the offspring of my heart. And today, no one doubts the existence of Belshazzar. Critics once claimed that even King David did not exist. King David, we, that's our, our mainstay of our, our theology, but King David didn't exist, they thought, because they could find no record of him outside the Bible. The common idea was that sometime after the Persians came to power in the 6th century B.C., David and Solomon and the like were invented by the Jewish scribes in order to boost the morale of the Jews who were then in exile. But in July of 1993, again in northern Israel, an inscription was found which is dated by archaeologists to the 8th century B.C. The inscription claims that the king of Damascus, Ben-Hadad of Syria, had killed the king of Israel, and that would be Jehoahaz, and the king of the house of David, that would be Joash of Judah, and you can find that same account that was on that inscription in 2 Kings chapter 13. But the realities are, this means the dynasty of King David was known 250 years before the scribes that were supposedly inventing him in the 6th century B.C. Few now deny the existence of King David as a figure in history. Time and time again, science cannot prove the Bible wrong. It only proves the Bible right. Time and time again, archaeology cannot prove the Bible wrong. It only proves it more right. And lastly, we have the prophetic accuracy of the Bible. Next week, we're going to talk about the New Testament. We're going to look at uh, those prophecies. But here we'll look at Old Testament prophecies. Firstly, Daniel predicted in chapter 2, four great successive world kingdoms. Babylon, Persia, and then Greece, and then Rome. Each de detail was fulfilled as these empires rose and fell in the coming centuries. It also suggested there would be no more empire like Rome. There would be no more world power. Hitler, Mussolini, and many others attempted to break that pattern, but still to date, since the, uh, the government of the Roman Empire, there has been no worldwide power. Isaiah predicted that a man named Cyrus would be born, would rise to power in the Middle East, and would release the Jewish people from captivity. Isaiah 45, 13 says, I will raise up Cyrus to fulfill my righteous purpose, and I will guide his actions. He will restore my city and free my captive people without seeking a reward. I, the Lord of the heavens' armies, have spoken. And approximately 150 years later, 150 years after that <coughs> prophecy, Cyrus the Great became king of Persia and released the Jews. No one could have known that would happen. Only God knew that that would happen. Ezekiel chapter 26, 3 through 6 says this, Therefore, this is what the Sovereign Lord says, I am your enemy, O Tyre. 
and I will bring many nations against you, like the waves of the sea crashing against your shoreline. They will destroy the walls of Tyre and tear down its towers. I will scrape away its soil and make it a bare rock. It will be just a rock in the sea, a place for fishermen to spread their nets. For I have spoken, says the Sovereign Lord. Tyre will become the prey of many nations, and its mainland villages will be destroyed by the sword. And then they will know that I am the Lord. This is really an amazing prophecy when you look at it, because for a time it looks like maybe this thing wasn't going to be fulfilled after all. In Ezekiel 26, a few verses later, 14, I will make your island a bare rock, a place for fishermen to spread their nets. You will never be rebuilt, for I, the Lord, have spoken. Yes, the sovereign Lord has spoken. Now, if King Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon laid siege to Tyre, there should be a map coming up here shortly, laid siege to Tyre three years after that prophecy was given. When he broke down the gates, he found that the city was almost empty. See, these were sailors, and so they had taken their entire, uh, everything they owned, and moved across to the island, across from the mainland, about a half mile offshore. They had reestablished their city on the island during the years of the siege. So they had sieged this land, they thought they had them covered, and they just escaped through the back door, went across uh, to the island there. They, uh, Nebuchadnezzar destroyed the city on the mainland, but since he didn't have a navy, and he was unable to do anything about the island city of Tyre, and so that left the prophecy partially unfulfilled. And so people could look at that and say, well, he got it half right. Um, but that doesn't sound like a biblical prophet to me. Well, about 250 years later, Alexander the Great came into the area of Tyre. He needed supplies for his eastern campaign. He wasn't trying to take over the community. He just said, I need supplies. And they said, no, you can't have them. Well, he got really upset about that. And so he was so infuriated that he had his army pick up the rubble that was left from what Nebuchadnezzar had done, his earlier devastation of the mainland city, and he threw it into the sea. And he built himself a causeway, which allowed them to march to the island and destroy the city, as was prophesied 250 years earlier. And if you travel to the site of Tyre today, you will see fishermen there drying their nets. And the city has never been rebuilt. And according to prophecy, I believe it never will be rebuilt. Statistician Peter Stoner said the probability of all the details of that prophecy coming true and happening by chance is one in 75 million that it happened, and yet it did. Not a single statement made by the Bible has been proven false, and we can trust the accuracy even of the copies themselves. You're probably aware, because of the great reverence of the Jewish scribes and copiers uh, that they held for the scriptures, they exercised extreme care when they made new copies of the Bible, the Hebrew Bible. Uh, the entire scribal process minimized the possibility of even the slightest of errors. We say that there were all these errors over the centuries of copying, but their, their process makes it almost impossible. When copies of the scripture began to wear, began to wear down, they were ceremoniously destroyed. And when new copies were generated, the materials used were strictly control, uh, controlled, including the types and quality of the ink, the color of the ink, the, the type of the paper. The condition of the room in which the copies were made were also tightly controlled. In addition to the cleanliness of the scribes, everything went, went down to a system. Nothing could be written down from memory. Each line was to be copied letter for letter from a reliable predecessor. So you've got the original and you're going to copy. You can't say, oh yeah, I remember this line. I did it 450 times already. You have to go line by line and, and take that and transcribe it over. But even more than that, they counted the number of lines and the letters and the words per page of the new copy and then checked it with the count of the original as well. If they did not match up, then that copy was destroyed and they had to start all over again. For example, in the Hebrew structure of the Bible, Leviticus 8.8 8 was identified as the middle verse of the Torah. When they got done with the Torah, they would look and, and count, and if it was not the middle verse, that copy was destroyed. A single word in Leviticus 10.16 was identified as the very middle word of the Torah. Again, by counting the words in, the, in their copy, if it didn't match, if that word was the exact middle, that copy was destroyed. And even to the single letter, the letter in Leviticus 10.42 was identified as the exact middle letter of the Torah. And they would count until they got there, and if it did not match, they would throw away that copy. They discovered statistically the total number of verses in Deuteronomy is 955. It had to match. The total in the entire Torah is 5,845. The total number of words is 97,856. And they would methodically check all of these statistics to make sure that their copy matched the original so that each book could be measured mathematically to see if there were any copying errors. 
to it. Yeah. When manufacturers today are concerned about quality control and consistency, they implement standardized procedures to ensure the quality of each product. If you want a reliable product, you've got to establish a reliable process to make sure the quality stays true. In a similar way, the ancient uh, custodians of scripture established important safeguards as a part of a painstaking process to ensure the accurate transmission and the accurate copying of the text. And so this morning, I, I want to go over again what we've just discovered, the, the authorship of the Bible, the authenticity of the Bible, the accuracy of the Bible allows us to know that our scriptures are just what they say they are. And the scripture does call itself to be the very word of God. That in fact, he is the author of their words. You see, throughout the centuries, various enemies have tried to destroy the Bible. Voltaire, a French philosopher and skeptic, in 1776, kind of a big year, I think, but in 1776, he predicted that the Bible and Christianity would soon be obsolete. And that he was going to play a large part in that. He said, he said, uh, in a hundred years from my day, there will be not a Bible in the earth except one that is looked upon by an antiquarian curiosity seeker. In 1778, in fact, he boasted this. He said, it took 12 men to start Christianity. This one is going to destroy it. And that was the year he died, in 1778. Fifty years after his death, you know what happened to his house? The Geneva Bible Society was using his press and his house to distribute Bibles. He passed away. The scriptures did not. Robert Ingersoll, a, a famous lawyer, said, In 15 years, I will have this book, the Bible, in the morgue. And exactly 15 years later, Ingersoll himself was in the morgue. And in his estate sale, a preacher bought his desk and spent his life writing his sermons on the very desk of the man who was going to destroy God's holy word. 1 Peter 1, 24, 25 says, People are like grass. Their beauty is like a flower in the field. The grass withers and the flower fades, but the word of the Lord remains forever. Voltaire and Ingersoll, notwithstanding, the word of the Lord remains forever. John MacArthur, Pastor John MacArthur, said this, Every time we pick up the Bible, we pick up the truth. Jesus said, If you continue in my word, you will know the truth, and the truth will make you free. What did he mean by that? Think of the person who's working diligently on a math problem. As soon as he finds the answer, he's now free. Or consider the scientist in the lab pouring different solutions into test tubes. He stays with it until he says, Eureka, I found it, and then he's free. Man will search and struggle and grapple and grope for the truth until he finds it. And MacArthur says, only then is he free. Let me close now, reminding us that the Bible is our source of truth about God, about man, about life and death about men and women and children and husbands and fathers and wives and mothers and friends and enemies. The Bible is the source of everything you need to know about life on this earth and the life that is yet to come. And we as Christians can trust the Bible. It is God's living and holy word. That's right.